So here are the the uh, domains within the dialogue of, of uh, integrative health uh, and the tools we've introduced uh, that often come up to uh, get at the underlying determinants of health. It starts as we've talked about with exploring what matters to the patient uh, in their current life and their current aspect and uh, their current uh, environment and context, and then begin to help work to move them towards understanding where they're ready to address some of those underlying determinants of healing. Uh, and the uh, nutrition component that we're gonna be talking about this week uh, falls into that second layer uh, on behavior and lifestyle in those areas. And so uh, we'll narrow in on that and show you how those questions come up and how you begin that kind of dialogue. Um, so here are the core uh, questions that uh, uh, if you do a, a full encounter uh, on integrative health visit uh, are the core ones that are asked. Um, and uh, this, you know, again, doesn't have to, you don't have to ha have the conversation about all of these. If the patient indicates in their PHI or in your discussion with them that they'd really like to do something to improve their diet or they'd like to address their food and diet, which often comes up, uh, that's already embedded as a question here under item two, domain two uh, in behavior and lifestyle. And this simple question of asking how the diet is, how their food intake is, often will elicit a response that can uh, let you know both how it is. Uh, we'll give you some examples of getting more detailed information about that, but also how they feel about how it is, uh, which uh, is uh, most more important in terms of behavioral change. I think one of the things that's really important uh, to communicate uh, is that it, food is not just about what you eat, it's also about how you eat and where you eat and the context in which you eat. Uh, we are uh, so obsessed in our society with chemistry and the components of food uh, and the nutritional aspects of that that we very often forget that the um, uh, that the process of eating can have as much influence over the underlying uh, components of healing as the actual content itself. For those of you who have had a chance to, to, to read my book, I tell a story of a series of research projects done by a Stanford uh, uh, researcher by the name of uh, Laya Crum uh, called Mind Over Milkshakes in which she does an experiment where she's measuring a hormonal level called grenoline, which is a, a, a hormone that is directly related to appetite and whether you feel hungry or don't feel hungry, satisfied or not satisfied. And she randomized uh, a milkshake uh, to, for individuals to drink. One, she labeled um, the um, indulge a shake, which was uh, said to be high fat, uh, high calorie, high sugar, uh, highly satiating, and one she called the census shake, which was low fat, low calories uh, in that area. And she randomized people to drink either the indulge shake or the uh, census shake. And then she measured the grenoline level responses on that. And she found marked increases in the satiation hormone, grenoline, uh, when people drank the indulge shake. Uh, however, the actual content of the shake, both shakes were identical. And so the content was no different, but the physiological response was markedly different. Again, depending upon the context, the expectations and the process the person had uh, to eat that. And so uh, not only how you eat, but also the mindset you bring uh, to eating is a key component of nutrition. Well, the science is actually fairly clear here. And despite all the confusion uh, that you see on the web and uh, in marketing materials about what you should eat and shouldn't eat, uh, the keto, the vegan, high fat, low fat, et cetera, the science actually is, is, um, is uh, pretty uh, important. Uh, and uh, it, first of all, the science says that nutrition is key and it is important. <laughs> That's number one. This is not something uh, that if you have a chronic illness, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, nutrition should ever not be part of the discussion. In fact, it is a key determinant for the top three of four causes of death, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. 
Nutrition is a key component for many other risk factors and other types of chronic diseases that people live with. I've listed some of them there. And your role really is to help patients learn about the resources in this area and identify what changes they're ready to make uh, to use food as medicine. Um, the underlying science behind these chronic illnesses and their link to uh, diet uh, is also pretty clear. And this is a remarkable overview of that published in Nature Medicine last year on the causes and the consequences of low, gr low grade chronic inflammation. And you can see on the left hand side of this graphic, a number of things that then lead to a, an elevated baseline level of chronic inflammation uh, that people will walk around with and when they have that elevated baseline, if that inflammation doesn't go back, uh, you know, to a lower level, will contribute to uh, the conditions that you see on the right. And as you can see, those conditions are the bread and butter of what we deal with in healthcare every single day. Uh, diet is one of the major causes. Uh, chronic stress that we talked about last time also can contribute to this. Um, but what happens is that these factors then lead to an elevated level of chronic inflammation, and that contributes to almost every major chronic illness that we have. And this article in Nature Medicine actually shows the specific links in the biology uh, to produce that inflammation. And so the goal, if you, if you think about the goal based on this science that uh, you're trying to uh, uh, to help the patient understand. It is if they can get their actual baseline level of inflammation lower, they have now lowered their risk factor for multiple chronic conditions in those areas. And so the fundamental thing that we're trying to do is actually create a lower baseline level uh, of chronic inflammation and using diet uh, to do that. So um, how do you do that? Well, as it turns out, there are, there are uh, foods that will increase your inflammation and there are foods that will decrease your inflammation. Here's an example of inflammation reducing foods. And one of the easy things to begin with with the patient is to send them a list of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory foods and say, uh, you don't have to go on a special diet, but begin to shift over and eat more of the anti-inflammatory foods and begin to eat less of the inflammatory foods. I have a guide for that. It's listed at the bottom in the link, uh, and it uh, shows those things that will reduce inflammation. If they are able to shift over to that, uh, then uh, oftentimes they are then addressing that chronic inflammatory set point that you're talking about, and they can notice uh, improvements in a number of things. Uh, notice that a number of these things are fruits and vegetables, whole foods, whole grain, uh, fish, certain types of oils, uh, spices of various types. I've listed a number of them there. Uh, turmeric is, is one that's well known in this area, but ginger, garlic, rosemary, a little bit of black pepper uh, work synergistically. Uh, green tea, which is not one that's on here, also does the, oh, actually it is, it's underneath that, under teas, also all have inflammatory processes. Uh, these are, uh, are tasty, uh, and uh, some of them uh, you can use as treats and snacks, like dark chocolate, for example, and red wine in limited amounts that has high resveratrol, which is also anti-inflammatory. So the basic concept of getting baseline inflammation down using foods is a concept you can get across. Foods also influence our immune system, and it has been estimated that up to 70% of the functioning in our immune system actually occurs within our gut. And the more we know about the so-called microbiome or the, how the bacteria then influence the lining of our gut and how the lining of our gut influences our immune system, the more we realize what the factors are uh, that contribute to this. And they are things like prebiotics and probiotics. What's the difference? Probiotics are bacteria, so-called good bacteria like lactobacillus that are often taken sometimes in tablet form, sometimes uh, you know, in drinks, et cetera, uh, to increase the level of good bacteria in the gut. 
prebiotics are foods that actually then take your, the bacteria that are already in your gut and begin to grow the diversity of, of the good bacteria uh, in the gut. And so those are things like fermented foods and fiber, uh, which are very important prebiotics. The emerging research now shows that it's probably much better to engage in prebiotic ingestion than probiotic ingestion. In fact, if you take a supplement with a single uh, type of bacteria or even a couple bacteria, uh, this might inhibit the ability of your gut to produce diverse, healthy bacteria in other areas. So it's much better to do prebiotics if possible than probiotics. Uh, drink water very often. We're busy. We forget to do that. Uh, my daughter carries around a water bottle and uh, tries to fill it up three or four times a day. Uh, it's a good idea also uh, for, eco for ecological reasons so you don't have to you know, get plastic. Fiber is a key prebiotic and in fact has the main impact on the microbiome. And, uh, and so being able to get fiber, especially vegetable fiber, uh, especially fiber that doesn't get digested, uh, can diversify the microbiome. And this can actually now be tested uh, before and after and has been shown to be linked to both uh, disease and healing of those diseases. Stress, uh, chronic stress uh, causes reductions in enzymes and stomach acid. Uh, and so re stress reduction, the relaxation response that we talked about last month, improves digestion and can improve the microbiome also and the inflammatory processes. Sleep uh, has a major impact on immune competence. Uh, and, uh, you know, the importance of sleep really uh, has uh, uh, only emerged in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, that even a, a single night of disrupted sleep uh, can raise the inflammatory processes in the body and alter and create susceptibility uh, uh, to infection and other types of things. The mind is also in the belly. In fact, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of sayings uh, in folklore about getting to the brain through the gut, uh, but this literally is true. Um, their, the mind is the largest producer of a brain hormone called serotonin. And uh, for those of the, you who recognize serotonin, uh, many of our antidepressants uh, are things that try to increase the serotonin level in the brain. But actually, one of the most effective ways to do that is by increasing the serotonin production in the gut. And some of the basic dietary changes I'll show you uh, today uh, actually can do that. Now, during the pandemic, there's a lot of talk about how do we boost our immune system, uh, how does that function, and nutrition can have a major impact on that. I've already talked about the microbiome and the inflammatory processes, uh, but food also contains nutrients. I've listed some of them here, zinc, uh, vitamin C, iron, vitamin D is another one, all of which uh, help bolster immune system and uh, may protect against uh, infection uh, including uh, COVID in those, in those areas. Um, but it's important uh, to realize that uh, it isn't necessarily just about the nutrient that's in it. Uh, these nutrients that are listed in these foods are just one chemical that happens to be in a very complex soup of nutrients, uh, and they work much better together than if you take them as a supplement separately. Occasionally a supplement is needed, but the, uh, the, the, the effect is much more effective if you can get it from the food and the whole family of nutritional components that go along uh, with uh, these nutrients. Okay, so here I have a question for you all. I'm gonna uh, let you answer this uh, first um, and uh, see what you think, and then we'll show you the answer. There are current guidelines, and this is from guidelines from the American Heart Association, American Cancer Association, Diabetes Association. Uh, they actually all converge largely on the answer to this question. How many uh, servings of fruits and vegetables uh, is it recommended a person get every day? Two to three, four to five, six to seven in those areas. So uh, we haven't set this up a, as a formal poll question, I don't think, have we, Jen? I don't think we've set this up as a formal poll question, but just answer it yourself. 
or you can put it in the chat. I see some people are doing that. There we go. We've got B, C, D. I haven't seen an A or an E yet. <laughs> Most people are going into B. Okay. Well, I think most people have been in the middle here, either B or C. And, uh, you know, the answer, if you look at all the guidelines, is C. Around six to seven is what's recommended fruits and vegetable servings a day. And so one thing that's a very easy way to get a sense of the nutritional quality, there are formal ways to do that, and your nutritionists will usually do that in a more formal way. But an easy way to do this in a discussion with a patient during an integrative health encounter uh, is to simply ask them what they had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner yesterday. Uh, uh, most people will tell you, uh, uh, and uh, your goal is not to judge them in any way on what happened, just to listen. What did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? Um, and simply count how many times they mention a fruit and vegetable. And if it is, uh, you know, below six, then they are probably not getting the basic components of fruits and vegetables uh, that is currently recommended by guidelines in those areas. So that gives you a, a very quick snapshot uh, as to the quality of the diet. Um, chronic pain and obesity go hand in hand. Uh, this is information that you probably know that uh, if a person has chronic pain and they're overweight, uh, each of those things is going to make them um, worse. Certainly body mass puts heavier loads on joints uh, and changes the way you walk and stand differently. That can aggravate chronic uh, pain. However, chronic pain also increases um, cortisol levels and inflammation. That inflammation then uh, uh, is increased uh, if you uh, have more fat. Uh, and so that baseline level of inflammation that I said uh, we want to try to get down uh, goes up. And so the pain reinforces the inflammation, makes it more difficult to lose the weight. The weight then uh, uh, increases inflammation and aggravates the pain. And we get into this feedback loop. Food can actually help interfere with both of those areas uh, and uh, impact uh, pain. Uh, pain isn't the only condition. In fact, it's not the main condition that we think of in food. Here's a list of things that if they have this on their uh, problem list, uh, then uh, uh, food uh, or the possibility of using food uh, to help them with the, in these areas um, uh, could be worth conversation and uh, worth then having an integrative health visit, giving them uh, the information about that, doing a hope note and a PHI. Okay. Now I'm going to cut through a lot of the uh, confusion that perhaps many of you have and certainly many of your patients have about nutrition. Um, fundamentally, uh, there is a, a type of a diet and there are variations on this diet, but they're fundamentally the same. And this is the most researched diet and found in rigorous randomized control trials to have an effect on many, many of the chronic conditions we've just listed and inflammation. It's called the Mediterranean diet, okay? Uh, we'll show you a little bit of that. In fact, it's illustrated uh, on the pyramid in the left, uh, and it is uh, heavy on whole grains, uh, fruits and vegetables, and then as you go up to the pyramid, diminishing um, fish and seafood are a key aspect, uh, uh, then uh, 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 milk, and then at the very top, uh, small portions of uh, sweets and meat in those areas. The Mediterranean diet uh, has been studied uh, in the most rigorous way of any diet that's available. Uh, and uh, I've listed there a number of educational handouts that you have available. Uh, you know, through their website, and uh, you can uh, customize them uh, uh, and get them to your patients, um, in which the anti-inflammatory components of the Mediterranean diet are also described. Um, 
The DASH diet is a variation on the same theme, but it is especially useful and again has been proven in good research for those with high blood pressure. So if you have somebody with high blood pressure, Mediterranean diet is still good, uh, but the DASH diet has been tested more rigorously for those ind individuals. Uh, the other links below are nutrition and pain guide. I'll show you uh, where you get those in more specific areas. But these are things that you can readily recommend to almost anybody with chronic illness, uh, that, the kinds of chronic illnesses that we've talked about before, because they are superior diets in terms of health. And uh, helping people to move in this direction is a, is a great way. So a number of uh, uh, websites uh, can really assist in this process. Uh, my favorite is the Mayo Clinic website on the Mediterranean diet. And I will often send patients a link to that to have them look it over uh, before I or the health coach will discuss it. Uh, Harvard uh, uh, School of Public Health also has a very excellent link and a number of resources including recipes, shopping guides, etc. around the Mediterranean diet. Um, the use of nutrition for specific conditions uh, are also, is also helpful and here's a list of resources that are available to you from our website and you can get others I believe you've developed there at Catalyst to add to this. A nutrition and Chronic Pain, a Counseling Pocket Guide, the Mediterranean Pocket Guide, which is a short uh, description of uh, the Mediterranean diet. Uh, cancer care, where does nutrition fit into that? High blood pressure, uh, how to navigate nutritional information because patients are often very confused of that, especially in the area of can cancer. And then certain sections of those that are caring for people in which they're trying to improve their nutrition also. Nutritional counseling is key to this and uh, Referral for nutritional counseling may be something that uh, that you'll want to do if uh, a patient has a condition like diabetes uh, or obesity in which nutritional counseling is indicated and paid for. Uh, it is a more extensive evaluation on nutrition. Uh, usually one hour they do a, a detailed assessment of the diet using uh, more uh, robust instruments than simply counting the fruits and vegetables. Uh, and they help formulate a per personalized health plan. Working with a nutritionist and with a health coach then is one of the goals in your, in your discussion with patients uh, to move them into if they have those conditions. Just a couple things that often come up, a couple questions that often come up in this area. Uh, you know, should I be eating all organic food? Well, it's not necessary. The basic guide is the things that uh, you eat right off the vine that are likely to be sprayed and you eat the surface of them. Um, some of those might be best to buy organic, but uh, things that you peel do not. And there is a, uh, is a an excellent guide uh, that actually has changed from year to year based on measurement of pesticides and other chemicals in foods. It's called the Dirty Dozen and it's updated, um, I think every six months to a year. And it tells you which ones you should probably get organic and which ones you don't need to worry about in those areas. Getting organized, planning out the meals for a week is an excellent way to begin to do that. Very often you can prepare a lot of those uh, components that go into those meals in larger amounts, uh, put them in bags, freeze them and pull them out. And then it makes for a very rapid production of a meal uh, during the week uh, when you're busy. Um, having fun in the kitchen, enjoying that, uh, uh, there are a number of classes online, cooking classes that you can do, uh, and uh, taking some of those uh, cooking classes uh, is important. And it's something that you can do with the family very often. The patients can do it with the family. Kids generally love to cook, depends on their ages, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, some guides there on that. Fad diets uh, are a great way to sell books and a great way to sell uh, food that gets delivered to you now, especially. Uh, but uh, the reason they're called fad diets is because most of the time they are exactly that. They're a fad. Uh, they're, uh, for the most part, uh, just reconfigurations of uh, someone who's trying to sell you something. And extreme levels of these things uh, can harm patients, especially if they have a chronic illness. Uh, if they have cancer or diabetes, for example, uh, going on particular uh, 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 fad diets can be harmful in those areas. Stick to the core, truly tested diets. I've mentioned those. 
dash Mediterranean diets. Uh, there's an alternative uh, healthy eating index the nutritionist may use, but patients can fill out online. Uh, cyclical weight loss is not good for health. If you lose a lot of weight, you gain it back, you lose a lot of weight, it actually causes endocrine disruptions that can aggravate a lot of the conditions that we talked about. So don't fall for fad diets. Uh, it's a lot simpler than you think. Uh, and we've mentioned how to do that. Financial considerations are important. Food costs a lot, didn't cost as much as it did uh, for our parents or our grandparents' time as a proportion of income, but it still can be very expensive. And uh, as people have had stresses and strains around their finances due to the pandemic, uh, it has aggravated sometimes uh, the ability to get healthy food in these areas. And there, were, are, there are already populations that you all deal with, many of you deal with who are in food deserts or cannot afford this. And they have shown that people are beginning to cut costs around um, uh, food uh, to get their medications or medications to get food. Uh, and so asking if financial considerations uh, are important or if they uh, for buying and the ability to get uh, healthy food should be something you should talk about. In the PHI, there is a, a question about whether uh, you have uh, challenges uh, with basic resources. And if that question is indicated yes, then a further in-depth dive around that is uh, necessary. Here's a couple resources uh, on that. Uh, visit Eat Right. Uh, there's a link there for that. Uh, community and government resources. Uh, canned and frozen vegetables actually can be a very good option if you can't get fresh ones. Uh, 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 flash frozen vegetables now are often done right on the field and might sometimes have a higher nutrient content even than fresh vegetables. And here's a link to food recipes um, uh, that uh, uh, can be done at low cost but maintaining their, uh, their health content at the Food Hero link in those areas. Uh, mindfulness is, uh, uh, is a key part. I mentioned earlier in this talk about the importance of mindful eating uh, and of mindset around eating. And there are a number of guides that can help uh, individuals learn how to be uh, more mindful in their eating. Here's a great book called Savor. Uh, there are apps that can help you do that. There are exercises uh, that you can take patients through, such as savoring a single raisin uh, to begin to have them uh, learn what it's like to slow down, uh, to chew, to taste uh, in those areas. Uh, and uh, this process in itself uh, can be very effective in impacting uh, reduction in calorie intake and improvement in some of the conditions that we talked about. Coaching people finding out where they're ready and beginning to, to move uh, them along, uh, identifying where their goals are, and then helping them to achieve those goals is the role uh, after the initial discussion. And I'm going to turn it over to, uh, uh, to uh, our health coach, Lexi Robinson, uh, who'll give you another example of how this can be done in the nutritional area. Uh, so Lexi, uh, go ahead and... Um, so after... Dr. Jonas has an integrative health visit with the patient and sent his note to me. Um, in this case, I'll give you an example of a patient, Will, who talked to Dr. Jonas about improving his diet and um, the Mediterranean diet was suggested to him, as well as learning about anti-inflammatory foods for pain. And the patient was interested in the OSCA device um, for localized pain. So the first thing that I did was send an email to the patient with the resources so that he could begin reviewing those, start some self-care and start thinking about what he wanted to do before we had our first health coaching call. So here are the links, as Dr. Jonas mentioned, to the guide from the Mayo Clinic. And we also have um, on his website, the Mediterranean Diet Pocket Guide and um, his anti-inflammatory diet guide. And then I also sent a link to the OSCA website so we could learn about that device. Okay, so during our health coaching call, which um, generally happens one to two weeks after the visit with the doctor, 
uh, we talked about what things that Will was interested in. And um, he was really interested in changing his diet. He wanted to lose weight. He also was looking to reduce pain by starting with some anti-inflammatory foods. So I had him open up the guide while we were talking on the phone and look over the list of the healthy foods. And we talked about what things on the list he thought looked good, um, what ideas he had for how he would implement those into his own diet. He liked the idea of fresh blueberries. Um, I think we talked about him putting them in his oatmeal and also into some salads. And he thought he would like to try chickpeas because he hadn't eaten those very much before, but with um, a desire to reduce red meat, that would be a way to bring more protein into his diet. So we talked about him having a goal in the next couple of weeks of looking more into the Mediterranean diet on the various websites and thinking about other ways that he could make changes. But those were two immediate goals that he could have. And he made a list. It wasn't too long, so it was easy to do just to add to his weekly shopping. And he agreed that he was going to pick those items up at the grocery store the next day when he was going anyway. And we also talked about reducing his visits to Starbucks because he could see that the, he already knew that the sugary drinks there were not good for him. Rather than cutting it out altogether, he agreed that he would try to go only once a week instead of twice. So we had some specific plans, but I let him lead the discussion and think about what things he would like, because if I suggest things, he's not as likely to do it as if he comes up with the ideas himself. So we do follow-ups in approximately two week intervals and then um, a follow-up with the doctor in two to three months. So during the two week intervals, each time I would talk with Will or any patient about what things have changed, what goals that he had set, what challenges he had, um, with nutrition, it might be something like maybe he got the chickpeas, but he didn't know what to do with them. And so during a health coaching call, we might actually look at some of the websites, talk about what other spices and flavors that he likes, and try to come up with ideas of recipes that he could make. And I don't have to be a nutritionist to be able to help him make goals and talk through some of those things that he can then do on his own. Um, we would also talk about other resources that might be available. Maybe he has a family member or a friend who he could talk to about some of these ideas of changing his nutrition and his eating. We reviewed these the last time, so I won't go over these in detail again, but these are things that I always keep in the back of my mind during these health coaching calls is just trying to talk to the patient and let them guide the conversation, um, talk about any obstacles or challenges they've had and get specific in their goals so that they're measurable, they're action oriented, they're time framed. Um, and when you're having uh, conversations with patients, letting that flow naturally, but making sure that you pin those down because that's where the change is really gonna happen. And then at the end of the call, I reiterate what I think the goal was, and then I ask them if that's correct, or if I didn't get it right, we talk some more about it and talk about how confident that they feel about whether they're gonna be able to accomplish this in the next couple of weeks. So that's pretty much it for this uh, nutrition health coaching. <laughs>